Thank you very much, everyone. On this occasion, I'd like to present topic hysteroscopic procedure prior to IVF. Is it a must? We know that uh, test tube baby was first discovered by Robert Edward and Patrick Steptoe in 1978. And in October 2010, Robert Edward was received Nobel Prize. And up to now, approximately already 8 million babies across the world already delivered by this kind of technology. If you talk about IVF, if you talk about test tube baby, the success rate or pregnancy rate were determined by at least three factors. Number one is embryo. Number two is endometrial receptivity. And the last is embryo transfer procedures. We know that embryo quality was determined by quality of sperms on site and also the etiology of uh, IVF, why the patient should underwent IVF. And the quality of on site are determined by age, stimulation protocols, ovarian reserve, and such the hormone uh, variants of testing, uh, such as epithets and also anti oligon hormone. And the metrics of TPT are determined by morphology and the metal perfusions. We know that the thickness, estradiol and progesterone uh, serum, Estradiol and progesterone ratio also is very important for endometrial perfusions. And the last uterine cavity abnormalities is very crucial for the success rate of IVF. What is currently we do in IVF for improving the pregnancy rate? Number one, of course, as the clinicians, we are trying to get the good, the good old side by a good ovarian stimulation protocol. And embryologists, they are trying to select what is the best sperms and also what is the best of site by establishing many biomarkers, starting from morphology, uh, genomics, and also time-lapse morphokinetic incubator. How to select the embryos? Yeah, you know, the morphology of embryo, metabolomic, respiration rate, time lapse morphokinetic embryo, the timing for uh, blastosis transfers, and then more invasive one is prime plantation genetic testings. And then for the clinician, how to do embryo transfers and how does the embryo receptivity we should support by giving luteal phase support that including uh, consists of progesterone and also estradiol. How about the uterine cavity and IVF success? Many unsuspected uterine cavity abnormalities, such as endometrial polyps, small submucous fibroids, small adhesion and septums, sometimes it's very difficult to be detected by using uh, transvaginal sonography. How is the prevalence? The abnormalities, congenital anomalies, starting from septum, no data, uterus be cornea about 46%, unicorn about 4.4%, and the delphi is around 11%. And the problem for fertility, of course, this is because of anatomical problems. How about endometrial polyps? with the prevalence about approximately 16.5 to 26.5%, endometrial polyp will inhibit glycodilin expressions in endometrium. And in triuterine, the adhesions will insult of endometrium and the fibroid will distort uterine cavity with the prevalence 9 to 16%. The type of fibroid will give evac will affect pregnancy rate in IVF with different result. Number one is subcellular fibroids. The pregnancy rate in plantation rate is not 
significantly different with the normal patients. However, if the patients have intramural fibroid, the pregnancy rate will decline and the lowest uh, if the patient has submucous fibroids, the pregnancy rate only approximately 10% and implantation rate only about 4%. So that's why if any abnormalities of uterine cavity, the success rate of IVF will be affected. This is the data about 2,500 result of orbistoscopic prior to IVF patients, we know that the, the normal is about 77.1% and the rest is abnormal. They found that the metapoly is 7.7% followed by Mullerian anomalies, septums, 5-2% and then fibroids is about 3.8%. So this is the result of 200 2,500 cases of ophistoscopic procedure prior to IVF. The prevalence of unsuspected uterine cavity abnormalities, abnormalities that were diagnosed by ophistoscopic procedure prior to IVF, you can see that about almost 88% uterine cavity are, were normal, and uh, the rest, there's abnormalities about 5.8% endometrial polyps, followed by adhesion, 2.2%, and then also fibroids, 0.7%. And this is the result of 1,000 of hysteroscopic prior to IVF. It's almost the same, 62% are normal, were normal, and then 32% uh, followed by endometrial polyps and others, intrauterine adhesions, septum, recurrent uterus, and retained product of conception. Endometrial polyps are identified by hysteroscopic procedure in 16.5% until 26.5% of women with unexplained infertility. And then pregnancy rate after IUI after the patients underwent hysteroscopy polypectomy, versus control is about 63.4% versus 28.2%. And this is the pregnancy rate in infertile women. If the patient underwent polypectomy, the pregnancy rate will be increasing until 78.3% or 50% and 76% depend on the studies done by Farnastat, Sokil, and SP1 Kiewicz. And then in normal uterine cavity, the control is about 42.1%, the pregnancy rate in infertile women. So the next question is polypectomy, is it needed? The interesting study by, done by Victor Gorman, in Fertility Strategy 2008, 83 women with ultrasound, with ultrasound identified small polyp less than 2 cm. 49% did not underwent polypectomy, 49 patients. And 34 patients underwent cystoscopic polypectomy under, after egg retrieval. And embryo was frozen, transferred in sub subsequent cycles. And interestingly, there is no statistically significant difference in the pregnancy rate between both of groups. So this is suggests that if endometrial poly less than two centimeters appear to have no impact on IVF outcome. The other thing in unsuspected of uterine cavity abnormalities is chronic endometritis. The study trying to correlate more hysteroscopic histologic and bacteriologic findings in prospective trial with 2,190 consecutive ophistoscopic procedures. You can see here the chronic endometritis at fluid hysteroscopy, endometrial mucosa appeal stick, edematose, hyperemic, and covered by macropolyp, less than one millimeter in size, 
with floating into the uterine cavity. The prevalence as percentage of infectious agent detected at vagina in the blue bars and in the mature culture in red bars in women with sign of chronic endometritis at hysteroscopy. We can see E. coli, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Enterobacter, Chlamydia, Ureoplasma, and yeast. I think most likely Streptococcus. And then this is the endometrial culture, and this is in the vagina. So that's why in the chronic endometritis, we should think what is the antibiotics that's sensitive to the bacteria that infected patients in the bedroom. How was our experiences in doing officioscopic procedures prior to IVF? In Dr. Chiptomon Sumo General Hospital, Jakarta. Yeah, this is among 145 patients. Yeah, 25% are normal, and almost 18% are chronic endometritis, and 37.2% are patients with endometrial polyps, and 2.8% we found adhesions or septum intrauterine. The others are very small. They have coronary uterus, endometrial hyperplasia, fibroid, or cervical stenosis. If you look at the meta-analysis in the I'm online, 2008, this is the outpatient endoscopic and subsequent IVF cycle outcome, systematic review and meta-analysis, showing us that favor cystoscopic procedures prior to IVF for improving IVF outcome. The question is why the success rate of IVF will increase after we perform extrascopic procedures. It's very interesting by promoting implantation by local injury to the endometrium, such as endometrial scratching, will improve the environment of endometrium that will become more receptive than control. So hysteroscopic procedure by water irrigation during hysteroscopic procedures will improving, will make uh, improving, will improving implantations by provoke local injury to the endometrium. So that's why yeah, in the meta-analysis, by doing hysteroscopic procedure prior to IVF, will slightly improving clinical pregnancy significantly. And the interesting one that observer agreement in the evaluation of the uterine cavity by stroscopic prior to IVF, in the total 123 stroscopic procedure recorded done by Brookman and Fatemi, intra-observer agreements on the appearance of any of predefined triuterine abnormal is very good, kappa almost 0.7. And then inter-observer agreement was moderate with kappa 0.49. So that's why hysteroscopic procedure prior to IVF might give benefit for improving clinical pregnancy in IVF. At conclusion, at least there are three benefits of hysteroscopic procedure prior to IVF. Number one, with improving if any difficulties during embryo transfer. The second thing is removal of unsuspected uterine cavity abnormalities. And the last will provoke cytokine pre-implantations. So all the three factors will improve in pregnancy rate in IVF, especially in the recurrent IVF failure cases. As take home message, number one, Hysteroscopic procedure should be considered prior to IPF. It's common, uh, especially with the patients with the history of IPF failure before. And number two, because of its advantages of hysteroscopy is most likely to be done. We can offer the patients to underwent of hysteroscopic procedure prior to IPF. And number three, is fairly important observed for agreement has important role in making diagnosis and treatment by hysteroscopy. 
inter and intra observer agreement is very important and the data intra observer agreement is good with inter observer agreement is moderate thank you very much for your kind attention and also thank you for pathobiotics cambodian who has already invited me to give a talk in this very prestigious event thank you so much